I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years I've put up with it now. I must stop Christmas from coming. But how? Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and have you laid out your goals for 2023? Today, to help you tackle what's next, we welcome NFL veteran Eric Wood. Wait a minute, goals? This guy's an NFL player. Shouldn't NFL players be talking about touchdowns? In our headlines, we always talk about how to put money away for retirement, but how do you take money out? We'll dispel one common myth. And then I'll share some lunar trivia. And now, two guys who want to help you get a major touchdown with your investments. It's Joe and O J J G. Happy Wednesday, stackers. We're so happy you're here that you found us. It is the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, and sitting over on the other side of the table from me, next to the drain pipe, it's Mr. OG. How are you, man? I said the drain pipe. That's not what that is right there? It's not chained to it. What's the thing tripping? <laughs> not yet. Depends on how the show goes. How's, how's, your, how's your Wednesday, my friend? It's actually a pretty cool day today. A lot of fun stuff going on. It is a good day. Well, how about it's a great day when you've got an NFL Pro Bowler coming down to the basement. Part of the Buffalo Bills broadcasting team, Eric Wood, joins us today talking about wow. some pivots he had to make in his life. And a lot of people, OG, we keep getting numbers this last week. More and more companies laying people off. So it might be pivots in some of our stacker family's future. Always is. Yeah, always seems to be. The case. And, it, and even if it's not today, I think we should always be ready for that. Eric Wood coming down to the basement. Big headline. So let's get this party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Oh, gee, I was going back through all of the themes of this year, thinking about anything that we might not have paid uh, enough attention to. And also thinking about the year that we had in the stock market. And some of these these pieces from early in the year resonate with me far more than they did back at the time. This is from Financial Planning Magazine in March, and it's an opinion piece by Justin Fitzpatrick. It says, retiree withdrawal rates can be misleading. Annual drawdowns tell us little about possible standards of living in retirement. And what he dives into is this. A lot of people get very analytical about what percentage rate they can draw down. In fact, earlier in the year, Morningstar even published some research saying that maybe you should look at instead of what we call the 4% rule finance geeks use, then maybe that's closer to 3.3. The author of that uh, piece himself came out earlier this year and said, listen, guys, that was for a particular period of time not meant for super long retirement, like my bad. He thinks it might be closer to five. It positions this number now as, as all over the place. Mr. Fitzpatrick in this piece says it has been historically all over the place. Like if you go back in history, OG, and you look at if you retired in the 1970s, how horrible it was going to be because you had the whole decade, this whole 10 year period where the market did nothing and it would be a difficult time to retire. If you retired leading up to the 1920s stock market crash, you were screwed, right? If you decided three years before that, that you were going to retire. different back then, though. Yeah, well, certainly, yeah. But his point is, is that even between the 80s and the 90s, just the different withdrawal rates you effectively could have taken over these long periods, what huge swings about what type of lifestyle you could have had. So my question is, here at the end of a bad year, does this mean that we shouldn't be using a rule like the 4% rule when we're thinking about how much money to take out? Like, how do we think about how much money we should take out if you look at this research that Mr. Fitzpatrick's talking about? I think ultimately the key when it comes to financial planning is flexibility. And the closer that you get your goals to 
like it has to go this exact way or else the more likely there is to be changes in your plan as time goes on. We use different types of calculation tools to kind of help think about retirement planning for clients. And we'll do just kind of straight line math, kind of like what you're talking about. Say, okay, I got a million dollars and it's going to grow at 7% and I can take out X percent per year and I want to live 30 years and I want the last penny to be spent on my last day. And how much can I take out? If that's your plan, what happens if you live 31 years? What are you going to do that last year? What if you live 19 years? Why are you dying with 2 million bucks in the bank and didn't do a whole bunch of stuff? You know, so financial planning is much more about flexibility and making small changes and adjustments along the way rather than radical changes like, oh, crap, that 4% thing should have been three. And now I'm almost broke. Oh, well, or I only took out three and I could have taken out six. Let's go buy a jet and I'm 89. Right. You know, that doesn't do anything either. So it's much more about flexibility. And this is why I think from a, from a financial planning standpoint, just kind of saying, well, I, I built a plan and I'm going to go do it is also misleading because you have to pay attention to it as time goes on. How you thought your plan was going to look at the end of 2022, to your point, is probably not how it really looks, you know, when you started it at the beginning of the year. A lot of people start the beginning of the year going, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do my plan for the year. And now we're at the end of the year. It's probably, you probably didn't put in there and uh, minus 17%. You know, right, you probably right. said, I think it'll grow at eight. This is how wild everybody, this is how wild these swings are. These are not little swings, like between 4 and 6% OG. These are monster swings. So, so let me give you two different scenarios. These are both for a 30-year safe retirement, right? If you retired May 1916, I realize this is a long time ago, so he's going way back. You had almost $1.4 million. You wanted to produce $55,000 a year. That's a 4.8% withdrawal rate. Because of the fact that the market did so poorly... A $1.4 million portfolio could only be relied upon to produce 55,000 bucks. But if you retired five years later in 1921, $580,000 would have done the same thing as your 1.4 million. Half the money would have produced the same result, a withdrawal rate 11.4. Let's get closer to now. He then compares March of 1961. $2.2 million in your portfolio would have produced $107,000 a year. So just over a hundred grand, but you would have $2.2 million OG if you retired in 1961 to produce a hundred thousand bucks. If you retired in 1985, just before that big, huge upswing in the late nineties with all the tech companies going crazy and the growth stock craze, just over $1.1 million did the same. 1.1 versus 2.2 created uh, 107,000. The other thing that's, I think, a little misleading here, just to kind of be clear, is this is also assuming there's no behavioral issues as it relates to the investments. We like to identify these scenarios in a vacuum, like they're one variable and everything else is constant. And that's not true either. It's like, yeah, there's going to be some changes to your withdrawal rate, but there's also changes to how you behave with your money. There's not very many people who are listening to this who didn't get wrapped up in a little bit of FOMO in the last two years or last three years since COVID, whether that was buying Tesla stock, buying Ethereum, buying Bitcoin, Googling, how do I trade stock options? You know, like there was some sort of fomo -ness going on in the last couple of couple, three years. And that affected sometimes positively and if you're holding crypto right now, sometimes significantly negatively, your investment portfolio. And so all of this stuff works together. And that's, I think, what the beauty of financial planning is, is that you can retire in your example, 1961, when the market's not going to do very well. You don't know that in advance, of course. That would have been nice to know, right? It's like the people who retired March of 2008, you know, it's like, would have been nice to know. I just waited a year, you know, didn't end on it. But there's a lot of other things that you can control along the way. You can control how you behave as it relates to your investments. Dalbar does a study every year, and their study says that the average investor gets 2.5% a year. And yet the average investment gets closer to 5. And you go, well, how is the average investment getting 5 and the average investor is getting 25 and it's because people do dumb things with their money. And to your point, 
if you do dumb things with your money at the same time as not so much fun going on in the market, you're compounding the problem. You're going to, you're going to make that withdrawal rate issue more severe because you're taking away the opportunity for growth. So financial planning is kind of an all encompassing thing. And, you know, we have to look at all the variables, I think, not just distribution. Absolutely. I think that's a great takeaway. We see people get very analytical. You've seen there's blogs about this. There are people writing huge things about what the true safe withdrawal rate is. Fitzpatrick's takeaway, and I think your takeaway, it sounds like, is start conservative, but spend a lot less time on thinking you have to lock down this withdrawal rate that's forever and spend a hell of a lot more time thinking about how you're going to do ongoing planning throughout retirement. Like spend a lot more time on what what is my process going to be for evaluating when I can take more and how I can take more. I think, OG, about our friend Paul Merriman. And Paul and I had a great discussion about how when the market goes poorly, they do much more like stay vacations where they explore the greater Washington area. A lot of beauty right where he lives. He's like, I'm very lucky. I can go hiking. I can go to the mountains. I can go see the ocean. I can do things around here. When we have a great year, that's when we travel the world, right? So he is making decisions year by year based on how well his investments did that year. And I think that coming up with a strategy like his, where I'm going to figure out how I'm going to evaluate it versus wasting a ton of time on which rule of thumb I'm going to use is going to be much more effective. Well, is that not how you do everything else throughout your entire life, right? How many among us go, oh, I got this really great bonus this year, so we're putting in a pool, right? You don't put a pool in if you had a crappy year and got laid off, generally. That's not, you know, some people do, I suppose, but that's not what most people would do. That's when you do the Jelly of the Month Club. When you do the Jelly of the Month Club, that's right. So all this stuff kind of works together. And the way that kind of we think about this is just kind of upper and lower bands, right? There's the number that we think is going to happen, the 50% scenario. And the further away that you are from exercising this outcome, this distribution plan, the less importance I think it has, because you have so much more control over things that actually matter. You have so much more control. If you're 30 and you're like, okay, my 4% number is going to be 1.1 million. What the heck are you doing, man? Get to like 2.5 million and then who cares? You know, then take four or six or two or eight or who gives a crap? Give yourself a ton of flexibility. If you're 65 and you're like, okay, this is all I've got. This is all I can do right now. Well, I would challenge that also and say, can't you work another three or four years? Like what happens if, you know, you get that, we talked about the last double. What happens if that last double happens while you're working as opposed to, you trying to do it while you're taking money out. So there's focus on the things that you can control and the further away that you are from needing this, the less impactful this distribution number is in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I think definitely on your order of operations, like what I focus on, set up for 2023, your planning time and how you're going to look at it. I love this idea of the bands too, OG. You know, I've got running a little hot, running a little cold, Set up those bands ahead of time, and I think you're going to yeah, do... make some adjustments. And if you blow past an upper band, go spend some more money. That's cool. You're well ahead of plan. If you if it gets a little close to the lower band, eh, staycations in Washington. We will dive even deeper into this topic on our free newsletter, the 201. Head to stackybedjamins.com slash 201. And uh, Brooke Miller from our team dives deeper into this with lots of curated links and uh, much, much more on not just the 4% rule, the changes there, but also ideas on how to set up your planning system to do even better. Coming up next, Eric Wood, former football center with the Buffalo Bills. He was drafted in the first round of the 2009 NFL draft. I think, OG, I'm going to ask him about uh, about being a first round draft pick and about the, the money involved, right? <laughs> lots, of, lots of money. He had to stop playing football unexpectedly, and he will tell you the story. And a lot of people having unexpected things happen. And frankly, OG, how many years over your career have you had clients call and say, hey, didn't see this coming. It happens several times a year. Uh, And you never know what is happening next to you. His new book is called Tackle What's Next. Get it? Tackle? Tackle? Yeah, but Uh he was an offensive lineman, right? Like, wouldn't that be called holding? 
holding what's next. You, you're, you're not allowed to tackle on the offensive line. I'm quite certain of that. Does this guy know anything about football? I know. Are you sure? He's a much bigger guy than I am. So when uh, he comes down from talking so about... just going to go with it? Uh, yeah. Whatever Eric wants, Eric gets. Sounds great, Eric. Wow. Never yes. thought of that before. Just, just brilliant. And he is brilliant. If you've never heard of Eric Wood, I think you're in for a treat. Eric Wood coming down to the basement in a second. Uh, but to get there, Doug, I think you've got some trivia for us. Absolutely do. Let's see if I can tackle this one, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And today is the anniversary of the last time we put someone on the moon. The United States spent $25.8 billion on Project Apollo between the years 1960 and 1973. That's around $257 billion in today's dollars. Speaking of the moon, okay, I promise I'm not going to go there. And since it's the holiday season, I'm going to throw you a softball. Here's a super easy one, folks. The moon is 250,000 miles away. So if you laid dollar bills out end to end, how many dollars would it take to reach it? Like, who doesn't know the answer to this? But just in case you don't, I'll be back right after I see if my money will stretch to the vending machine. there, stackers. I'm stock market astronaut Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. As it turns out, the amount of money the United States spent to go to the moon could have created a few loops there and back. You know how the government likes to spend. So how many dollars laid out end to end would it take to reach the moon? 250,000 miles away. About 2.5 billion. Jeez, seems like we should have just done that. Would have been way cheaper. And now, to help you think about your goals, Eric Wood. And I'm so excited I get to talk to this gentleman, a guy whose career I followed from afar for a long time. Eric Wood is here. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Joe. Hey, I got to tell you, I almost had to cancel this interview because I am a Detroit Lions fan and the crap you guys pulled on us on Thanksgiving Day, and I know it's no longer your issue, Eric. That drove me crazy. What's up with that? Uh, what do you mean crap? I mean, the Bills got it done and they were expected to win and that's what happened in the end. But no, that was one heck of a ball game. And um, luckily, I, I, I commute to the Bills games as I'm calling them from Louisville, Kentucky. So that wasn't too bad of a commute home as well. No. Well, yeah, for you, it's funny. I live in Texas now and uh, I had a friend who's not a longtime Lions fan like I am. And he's cheering for the Lions just because he's standing next to me. You know, you've been at those things. You just want to get along. And I yep. put my arm around him and I said, Sean, I know you haven't been a Lions fan for long, but we will find a way to lose this thing. And sure enough, <laughs> Josh Allen and your Buffalo Bills found a way at the end. I was, you know, I get tired of saying Pyrrhic victories and, and the fact that, man, the Lions were close. But the fact that the Lions played with Buffalo, you know, gave me a little bit of excitement. Yeah, Dan Campbell's building something special. You want to talk leadership most organizations mimic their head coach and mimic his actions and demeanor. And that team plays very hard. They're very scrappy. And it seems like the culture is set up for success there, or maybe it hadn't been for a while. And I just, I just hope he gets his proper time to truly establish everything there. And uh, with them picking up that extra first round draft pick from the Rams, that could be a really valuable one this year. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? You definitely do a little bit in your book. You talk about some of the coaches you've had, but talk about coaching in our stackers life, Eric, how important do you think it is to have coaches in your corner? Well, I know for me personally, I don't feel like I can get better at anything in life, whether that was me progressing through football, whether that's me trying to be a better golfer at this point in my life, or as I transitioned into more business roles or broadcasting, I think coaching and feedback is just the key to success. We we often miss so many of our blind spots if we don't have proper coaching in our lives. Now, I had an executive coach as well when I was transitioning out of the NFL, and I had world-class coaches for many years prior. And so I am huge on coaching, and I also think that we can learn from anybody. So a coach doesn't necessarily need to have a coaching title. I talk about it in the book. I have an advisory board that I bounce things off each year because I transitioned into my second career at 32 years old. Well, there was so much that I didn't know about investing and business opportunities and even creating my own schedule 
that having coaches and mentors and people around me to give me feedback has just been so valuable in my life. I was at a coaching session yesterday, getting coaching all day. And we actually had this discussion about an advisory board. And this is what I love about podcasting. I'm sure it's what you love about podcasting. I didn't know we were going to have this discussion, but I really want to go right. here while we're here. Who's right on that advisory board? And do you think that's that's a good thing for most of the people listening to just have this board of advisors? And uh, you know, while we're at it, Eric, if you do think it's good, who's the wrong fit for that board? The wrong fit would be, that would be easier to answer. The wrong fit would be a yes man, because we can have so many yes men or yes women in our lives just naturally, and you're not going to grow necessarily from their feedback. You want people that care enough about you that they can give you some criticism as they see it. Likely, if you have things implemented in your life, you assume that they are a good fit for you. So great fits would be people further down the line from you in any industry you're looking to improve in. I'm all about being successful in all buckets of life. And that's yeah. everything from health and fitness to faith, to career, to relationships, to your emotional health. I'm, I'm adamant about being successful in all buckets of life. And the people that I admire that have success, it's not necessarily just wealth. It's not just financial success, even though I as well want to stack the Benjamins. But that being said... I want to have people on my advisory board that I see as well-rounded individuals, and maybe they have an expertise in finance. Maybe they have an expertise in health and fitness, but I want them to analyze everything I have going in my life and, and help me with those blind spots. And generally, they're going to be a little bit further down the road than you. That doesn't necessarily mean older, but further down the road from you that they can give you that wise feedback. I love that idea that they're not necessarily older. I have some friends that have been through areas I'm trying to get to that are a few years younger than me and definitely have way more experience uh, than I do there. Can I ask one tactical question? Uh, how does that work? Do you, do you jump on a Zoom call together like once a quarter? Is it whenever Eric needs feedback? Do you pay these people? Is it like beer and pizza at Eric's? I don't, I don't, tell me tactically how you get this going. So pre-COVID, we would meet at, at a central location, and not everybody was from Louisville or wherever we had this meeting, and I would pay for travel, but then you know there was some hospitality along the way as far as meals, and if, especially if they came in from out of town, it might be dinner the night before, the dinner the night of the advisor board, but essentially, it's a sit-down. Uh, when it was in person, it would last a lot longer. There was much more, uh, much more time spent on introductions for everybody to get some more benefit. The last couple have been via Zoom, and those lasted in the 90 to 120 minutes where I'm sending them a lot of material on the front end saying, here's everything I got going in my life. Here's where I'm looking to get to. Help me figure out where my blind spots are and give me some feedback. And it's amazing how much great feedback you can get from people. And, and you ask, do I pay them? No, I don't, I don't pay them monetarily. Now, hopefully I can provide value to them back in return to repay them. But it's amazing that I went in with so much imposter syndrome, so much worry that these people would be feel like they were wasting their time. These are valuable individuals. I understand their time is valuable. Mine is, is as well. And so my executive coach who introduced me to this concept of advisory boards, I was so worried I was going to be wasting their time. And it's amazing as I reach out to them individually afterwards, how many of them say that they actually feel like they got more from it, listening to others, yeah. listening to everything I have going on. And it's amazing how when you pour into others, you, you feel that you feel that sense of pride. You feel kind of a sense of worth by being able to pass those lessons along. And so and I would say this, talk about coaching, talk about mentoring. The way you honor those individuals is by putting it into practice, what they told you, and then following back up with them. So you have an advisory board member that says you need to do something or recommends you do it. Once you get that done, let them know. And that really sparks them up. We're going to talk about you and pivoting here in just a moment. And I want to skip to the back of the book just to kind of keep the same thread that we're on right now, Eric, that I had no idea we were going to be on, but you, but you spent a lot of time talking about gratitude and the importance of, I feel like you equate in a lot of ways, gratitude with wealth in your own life. And when you've made pivots, having gratitude has really helped you to speak to that for a moment, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, people will often ask me, 
what I regret most about my NFL career, or do I have any regrets from my NFL career? And I, and I say, and it took some introspection, but I would say the first six years of my life, I just truly wasn't grateful for the fact that I was in the NFL and it was constantly chasing another contract or it was recovering from an injury or trying to make another Pro Bowl or another Walter Payton Man of the Year award. It was always chasing and never introspection and, and taking the gratitude that, wow, I went from having one scholarship offer to college to a first round draft pick to being able to play for the same team for nine years. There was so much to be grateful for, and I was missing it. And so uh, inspired by John Gordon, who's now become a friend, and many others, I started a gratitude practice in my life that has changed over time. Like everybody out there, your routines, your morning routines, whatever it may be, those are going to be ever-changing to fit your lifestyle at the time. When I first started, it was driving to the stadium, which was less than five minutes from my house, just in silence, and as I would see the stadium lights say, wow, I get to work in an NFL facility today. Whether I'm driving with my left foot because my right foot's in a boot because I'm injured, <laughs> I get to go to work here today. How special is this? I'm a captain of the team. I get to be a leader of 53 alpha males in an NFL facility. How cool is this? And I would go in with my hair on fire, and that, that kind of season of gratitude showed me the importance of it and we expand on it so much more in the book and what that does to you psychologically and rewiring your brain and trying to find the things in the life you're grateful for as opposed to what you're not. And it's it's worked wonders in my life. People not watching the video have no idea how big an event this was for me reading this part of your book as I was prepping for this. But last night as I was putting together my final questions, Eric, you spurred me to, and I'm showing you just a text string, just to show you and everybody online, this friend of mine, Jason, I said, I'm particularly concerned I didn't express how grateful I was that you kicked off my tour. He was when I had my own book tour at the beginning of last year. And as I look back this year on the end of my year, I thought about people I hadn't expressed gratitude to, and he was number one. And it's funny how I'm reading your book and your gratitude practice. And I, and, and I really need to thank him. I said, I didn't, I didn't really have time to thank you that night. And I neglected as I got busy and crap hit the fan, I wrote. And he said, all good, my friend. It was my honor. Truly, let's raise a glass to the tour when you get back to Texarkana. Uh, first drinks on me, which was which was awesome. Which means also, guys, it's never too late. Like, it's never too – sometimes yes. I think we feel like it's too late to say thank you for stuff. And, and man, it, man, it's not. But I want to shift – completely because we are so far off where I thought we were going to go today. It's been awesome, but so far off where I want to go. I, I wanted to ask you before I get into the beginning of the book and why you particular are a huge person to talk about this idea of pivoting, but most of our stacker community has never been involved with an NFL draft or the contract stuff that you've gone on. Obviously it's a show about money. Did you know we have Philip Buchanan on? I don't know if you know Philip Buchanan, longtime Lions player wrote a book about how, when he went to the draft, Eric, he was already broke because his family had already spent most of his money that he didn't have yet. Did you have any idea what type of a contract you were getting into? And then tell us a little bit about that first contract negotiation, how that goes as a first round draft pick. Yeah, so it, you're slotted essentially where you cut, you know a range. So I was drafted 28th. I'm going to hit somewhere between the 27th and 29th pick. It's going to be a gradual raise over the previous year because the salary cap goes up, the rookie wages go up and all that. And so I had a ballpark range, but I had really no concept of money. And I come from a very blue collar background. And luckily, we had great veterans on the team at Buffalo that weren't big spenders. So if anything, through my first contract, I underspent money just because I was so unfamiliar and almost uncomfortable spending the amount of money I had. Now, we have a greater understanding now. But I'll say this, Joe, I got drafted in April of 2009. There was not a better time to get drafted. Maybe I mean, that was the start of the greatest 10-year run of the stock market. I invested yeah. heavily in the stock market. And so for every dollar I put in, it paid off big time for the lifestyle that we get to live now. Did you think that that was the stock market or at the time, because you're young, did you think you were a genius? I did not think I was a genius. I promise you that. I trust an individual is much smarter than me. I try and outsource anything I'm not an expert in. Like with my own podcast, I don't do the editing. I don't do the clips. I don't do a lot of the social media graphics. That's all outsourcing. And so I outsourced 
my financial investing as well. Maybe that's why you still have hair and I don't. Maybe right. that's the difference right there. I should have I should have met you sooner, dude. Uh, let's talk about this pivotal time, your seventh year in the NFL. You'd uh, you'd locked up your second contract. I'm wondering first, second contract more difficult or less difficult than that first one? Uh, more difficult because there's a wide range. I could have sat around and waited for free agency. I ended up signing a contract extension with the Bills before my fifth season. I was signed to a five-year contract initially. And so that training camp, now I'm coming off a knee injury. And so I'm worried about this knee all through training camp. We're negotiating generational wealth, even where they initially offered would have created generational wealth for our family. And so to turn that down day after day and still go out to practice, potentially get hurt. I mean, there was silly bliss nights and, and, and I, that's not a metaphor there. There were literal sleepless nights because I was so worried that something could happen and it would affect that future earning, but it all worked out. And I was so fortunate to be able to play my entire career with the bills. And yes, I played in the longest playoff drought in all of professional sports. And I know as a lions fan, you don't give me much sympathy (laughs) there, but (laughs) but we literally played the lions one year and we were both Oh, and eight heading into the game. That was my second year in Adamakung Sue's first year in the league. And we were both Oh, and eight in that game. And so despite not having team success until my final, Final year when we ended up breaking the playoff drought, it was special to play for one organization and, and to be honored and, and treated to two contract extensions. Walk us through this pivot then. So you're on this team that miraculously is turning it around. You're super excited about where the season's going. You're going into the playoffs against Jacksonville. And for the first time in your career, you write, you're of two minds. You really want to win because that's what you do is win. But on the other side, your spouse is having a baby. You're you're having a baby. So on the other side, you're a little okay there. Walk me through the events because there's a lot packed into a short period of time now between playoffs and your child and, well, what we're about to talk about next. I signed a contract extension prior to the 2017 season where everybody around the country thought we were tanking. We had just traded away our previous top draft picks from the previous three drafts. And so... Everyone thinks we're tanking, and I'm the guy that Brandon Bean extends a contract extension to during training camp, and I sign it. You know, I'm worried that maybe I'm going to be traded as well, but I want to stick around this organization until we break this playoff drought. I can't leave, and so I sign a contract extension. I'm the only player on the team to play every single snap that season, which is rare in the NFL because your shoe could come off, you could get hurt. You could be beating a team too bad, losing too bad. There's so many reasons why you can be taken out of an NFL football game. And I play every single snap that season, including the playoff game when we break the longest playoff drought in all professional sports. An absolute high in my career being able to do that for the city of Buffalo. Well, I'm ready to go back to Louisville, see the birth of my son. I go to exit physicals, which everyone has to get an exit physical before leaving for the off season, just to make sure everything's okay body wise for you. And I said, look, I played every single snap. I'm the only one on the team to do it. Clear me for the Pro Bowl. I'm getting out of here. I'm driving back to Louisville. And they said, you had some stingers this year, which my high school buddy got stingers. So I was not concerned about those. And they said, you got those stingers. Let's get an MRI on your neck. And long story short, Three days later, while I'm sitting in the delivery room waiting on the birth of my son, I find out that my career is over. Even with surgery, the way that there's disc and bone sitting in my spinal cord at C2, C3, I'll never be able to play football again. And so that put me on a path where I immediately had to pivot. It wasn't a... It wasn't the walking away on my own terms that I had envisioned, that we all envision as an NFL ball player. And to be able to play as long as I did, that was my ninth season in the NFL, and I had just signed a contract extension. I thought maybe I would be one of the types that could walk away on my own terms. I'm reading you writing this, Eric, and I'm just thinking you're at one of the happiest moments that a man, well, either you or your wife will ever have, the birth of a child. And minutes before your wife is crying to the point that the nurse comes in and says, no, it's going to be okay. (laughs) Like it's going to, and she doesn't realize your wife is crying about something totally different. I kind of wish, you know, just for somebody on the sidelines, I wish that that call had come an hour later. Like, oh, what a horrible time. 
Yeah, but we had got a little bit of information that something may have been wrong and maybe you're looking at surgery, maybe you'll be fine and just rehab, or maybe it could be career ending. And I got the news just before. And when the call came through, one, you never know exactly when the baby's coming. And then also, even though we were in the delivery room, and then also me and my wife wanted to know if we would have sat there for the next 50 minutes wondering what had happened, we would have rather had that information. But yes, uh, the fact that the call came just then, was it's just all part of the story, Joe. It, you know, everything yeah. happens for a reason. It becomes part of a story that maybe someone else can relate to that can be impacted as well. Well, you begin with that, with this quote uh, that is, you're right where you need to be right now. Literally the first words in your book. Talk about that because I know that uh, even though you have this devastating, frankly, point of your career and a point where you're not sure what you're going to do next, you wouldn't write that at the beginning of your book if you didn't believe that. Yeah, you're right. And, and, and I truly do believe no matter where you're at right now, whether you're sitting on the mountaintop or you're down in the valley, you are there for a reason. You can gain so much perspective. And when we often grow the most during those times of adversity, even though they're not pleasant to be in. So if you're in one of those storms in life, understand you are going to come out of it and you're going to take perspective from that. You are going to become more mature, more complete because of those moments even if that time sucks right now. And so in those moments, it's okay to not be all sunshines and rainbows, but understand that there is another mountaintop coming if you're willing to dig yourself out of those times. Yor, we talked about coaching earlier. Your coach asked you a series of questions that I think a lot of us, frankly, should ask ourselves as we're beginning this journey toward whatever our next pivot is, as we're tackling whatever's next. Walk us through what those questions are that your coach asked you. Yeah, and, and really it's, what are your gifts? Who do you want to serve? And when you serve others and bring value to others, you will in turn receive value. I've heard it said, when you bring value to others, you'll, you'll make money. When you bring value to valuable people or the masses, then you will create wealth. And so you bring value to others by using your gifts. And often it's so hard to figure out what our gifts are, especially as a former ball player, because all we've been told and our entire identity is generally wrapped around in being a ball player. And so when that is taken from you, identifying other gifts can be very difficult for me and many others. Oftentimes you have to ask others to help you out identifying your gifts and then figuring out ways to serve others in those moments. You were surprised by what your wife said was one of your best gifts. Yeah. And, and she said discipline and, and I had hoped that, but I just didn't, she gets to see all of my actions on a day-to-day -day basis. She gets to see the birthday cake and maybe a, a Sunday morning when I sleep in after a couple too many drinks on a Saturday night. But the fact that she identified the discipline that I lived with on a daily basis uh, meant a lot. And, and it's often those closest to us that you'll take their opinions the highest. What I loved about that story was you were at a time of your life where you'd gone from heavy discipline to really, frankly, no discipline because you didn't, you, you, you joke in the book that you said that on one hand, you're like, what am I going to do next? Like big, big picture. What am I going to do next? But then literally, what am I going to do after breakfast? Cause I have, I have no idea what I'm going to do, but the thing that you identify, and I like the fact, and I think this is a big message for all of our stackers, Eric, is you identify something as a trait of yours by really widening the scope of what you look at. You're not a ball player. You're a communicator. And I even, I remember stopping reading this part of the book because I thought, you know, I don't watch football and think the offensive linemen are, are going to be the world's greatest communicators. But then you go through all these ways that you have to communicate and all the professional communication you've done, like identifying that and widening the scope, I think is difficult for a lot of us. Yeah, it can be, especially during troubling times in your life. We get so narrow minded in those times. And broadening the scope can be so valuable. You're talking about the communication and it's, you know, it's media communication. You see that, but it's communication with your coaches. It's communication with your teammates on the field. It's communication in the huddles. It's going to the sideline and relaying what the defense is doing so we can make adjustments. And so that allows you to be a quick thinker on your feet, a, a quick communicator and relaying issues. And then also you have experience in front of the camera because 
Um, as Marshawn Lynch famously said, I'm just here because I have to, or I'm just here because <laughs> I don't want to be fined. We can be fined right. for not facing the media. And so you gain experience and by doing as best as you can on a daily basis, you'll, you'll improve your communication skills in the media. Well, that quick communication you have to have on the field, just after I read that, just realizing that you're the one telling the rest of your team about the defense that you think that they're playing and helping everybody identify it. And the quick, because that communication has to happen fast before, you know, you're on a clock between every play. I thought that was, that was fantastic lesson. I think for all of us who don't realize what a clock we're on, the book is called tackle what's next. I absolutely, I absolutely loved it. I told you, Eric, before we hit record that, I don't get to read the entire book of a lot of books, and I can't wait to finish up the rest of this. Great holiday gift. And I'm assuming, Eric, you can get the book everywhere, right? Yeah, you can. It's available everywhere books are sold. Eric, thank you so much for helping our stackers on their pivot. I I really appreciate your time. No, my pleasure. Hey, this is John in Seattle. And when I'm not telling terrible dad jokes to anyone who will listen, I'm Stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Eric Wood for dropping by. And in fact, if you're interested in in some of the things going on with college football, OG, I know that you are, and Doug, I know you are, about uh, college players now finally being paid for their likeness, for their, you know, being able to get some money when schools and organizations use them in their marketing. Uh, what does he think about that? Also, I asked him about a recent video I saw that uh, Tom Izzo, the MSU Spartans basketball coach never heard of about the transfer portal and about, uh, you know, all of these, the transfer portal. In fact, I think we might do a TikTok minute with Izzo's take. So people, people hear that we'll do that soon. Cause I think that's also relevant to your money, but, uh, all of that and much more around things that just people interested in football will be interested in. We will have on our YouTube page. So go to the stacking Benjamins YouTube page to see more about that. But what I want to focus on here, OG, is his knowledge that you're not going to get better by yourself. I think this is a great year and lesson for 2023. You know, what's that phrase? The brain that got you here is not the brain that's going to get you out, right? That to get to the next spot, you have to think differently. And Eric points out, I think very succinctly, that having other people around you to point out where your strengths are so you can start stacking your strengths is a huge win for most of us. Yeah, that's what we call unique ability. That's the that's the word that you and I use, Joe, and trying to create a team at Stacking Benjamins and a team at our planning company around everybody using their strengths. And that's how you can think about, you know, your life as well. Like there's things that you're really good at. Are you better off by doing more of the things that you're really good at? Or are you better off by getting better at the things that you really suck at, you know, or not as good at, right? Is that better for you or is it better for the people around you? for you to do the thing that you're really, really, really super good at. You know, Joe, that phrase you just used, I hadn't heard before the, the brain that got you here, isn't the brain that's going to get you out. I hadn't heard it that way, but it, it reminds me of golfing with OG because it's basically the same thing. He yells at me when I'm in the woods and I'm trying to hit the shot out of the woods and like get some distance. And he's screaming at me, dude, if you had this shot, you wouldn't be in the woods in the first place. (laughs) Just punch it out. Take your medicine. Punch it straight out into the fairway. What are you thinking? I mean, he's like just screaming at me. So it's the same thing, right? I remember, Doug, a great advertisement. One of my favorite advertisements was for Golf Digest. And there was a little clip of of a golf pro saying, you'll never hear a PGA Tour member going, okay, right after I blast it through these trees, everything's going to be great. Like a pro never does that. Never, ever. I thought Doug was going to say, the three wood that got you here is not the three wood that's going to get you home. It's <laughs> a little inside And joke. that's because you threw it in the pond. Made of yeah. wood. So I put it back in the woods where it belongs. <laughs> he put it back in its home. And this idea that Eric had also of a personal board of advisors, you know, we've had a, a board of advisors for the show that I think has been incredibly helpful for Stacking Benjamins. But Doug, have you ever thought about this idea of surrounding yourself with a personal board where maybe once a year, like Eric did, you just give them data. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what I'm trying to do. And have these people kind of help you with being a better you. You know, I do think about that, but not in this 
and I should, uh, I should do it in an overt sort of planful way where you almost document it out. Hey, here's the person or people I have on my team that are going to advise me on these aspects of what's going on in my life. And then here's the other, you know, other people who are going to advise me in different aspects. I don't do it that way. And I don't, I don't think most of us do. I think we just sort of accumulate friends that we end up going to for advice yeah. when certain types of situations happen, whether it's parenting and you admire the way somebody's kids have been raised and you know how they result. So I'm going to call this person because they did a great job with their kids or it's legal or whatever. But I don't think enough of us do it in a very planful kind of a way that says, here's my team and document it. I wrote that I like down that when notion. I was, well, yeah, when I was talking to him, like codifying this or institutionalizing it, making it a real thing. And the fact that you think your friends are going to say no, and they don't, he said, this, he's, he's done oh. this with lots of people and, and, and your friends go, no, I'd love to come to that meeting and rip holes in you and <laughs> tell you what right. an idiot you are. I'd be honored <laughs> to come and point out how much of an idiot you are. I've been waiting for this opportunity <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When your board of directors comes to the meeting and they're on their third beer, it might not be a good sign. <laughs> might, might be pretty bad. Hey, let's uh, throw out the Haven Lifeline, guys, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency OG, they put what you value first. I am uh, really looking forward to later today. I just have a lot of fun stuff going on on this Wednesday, so... Super excited. That is fabulous. It's your loved ones and your time and fun stuff with That's them. That's what's most important to me. Yes. It's not filling out life insurance nope, apps. just by myself. Oh, just by, <laughs> maybe I don't want to know. That. I'm not doing that today. I no. Don't, I don't want to know, but it's not, I bet, I bet what you're not doing is filling out life insurance apps. No, wouldn't even consider it. You want to get on with your life. You want to get this done. That's why Haven Life has streamlined this whole process. Their application is simple. It's online. You'll get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable, and you have the confidence in knowing their policies are issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, which is more than 160 years old. Head to stackybenjamins.com slash Haven Life for more. Today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline. To Brian from Wisconsin again. I can bring him back if you need him. <laughs> oh, I can God, probably no. get him. Please, no. This, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll take that under advisement. We're, we're going to send that to our board and see. But Justin has a question for us. Hey, Justin. Hey, Joe, OG, and Doug. Long-time caller, short-time listener. I have enough free shirts that everyone in my family has one, so I'll donate this one to Doug. But here's my question. I have a 529 plan for my oldest. I'm going with OG's plan of all stocks. Freshman year of high school, I'll take out what's needed for freshman year of college and so on. But at some point, the money I'm contributing will have less of a tax benefit since it won't grow as much before taking it out. I was thinking at some point of to stop putting money into the 529 plan, start putting money into a regular brokerage's account so the money is more flexible. I'm not sure how to evaluate when I should make that change. Any advice you can give is always helpful. Wait, what'd you say? The dog ripped her shirt? Sorry, Doug. Looks like I'm going to need that shirt after all but I'll send you a buy one, get one coupon for the Sizzler for you and Gertrude. See ya. <laughs> and and uh, Eric Wood said that Josh Allen knows how to do a fake. That was a nice fake. Had me, and he lost me. He, he put it right out there, Doug, and he pulled it away. Nice job, Justin. Too bad for you. Not cool. Oh, gee, let's get on this. What do you think? Well, uh, firstly, I, I don't know why you would uh, stop putting money in your... 520. I, mean, I guess you could arguably say, hey, by the time they're a senior, it's probably not going to grow that much moving forward. So there is at some point, but even as close as being a freshman, you know, now you're starting to talk about market timing, right? If you're saving the full amount, we talk about having $100 per year of school from 18 till or from, you know, birth to 18 to pay for college. So if you're saving $400 a month, let's say you're, you're max funding your 529 to pay for your, your kid's entire school, and they're a freshman, you're still saving 5000 bucks a year. That money can grow maybe 6 8 10% for a couple of years. You know, it just you know, it depends on kind of where we are from a market standpoint. So I don't know that I would automatically say, well, it's not going to grow anymore. And if you're following that same kind of methodology of saying, well, as I get closer to being a uh, college student, I'm going to start taking less and less risk with it and kind of move it into fixed income or cash, then wouldn't you do the same thing in your brokerage account? 
So I think ultimately it's going to depend on whether or not you want to fully fund the school in a 529 or if you want to have some flexibility outside of that. And so that doesn't matter where you're saving the money. If you say, well, I only want to have 50% of my college funds saved in a 529 and yet you're saving 100% of it, well, then, you know, you'd be putting half the money in a brokerage account anyway from day one, if that makes sense. So I would be thinking about it from the perspective of how much do I want in the 529 relative to the overall cost that I feel like paying and just strive to get that number. And if you've got more money available to save or invest, either use it for another goal or, you know, increase the goal that you have and then use that money in the brokerage account then. So I don't know that the time of it really would factor into it in my mind. Yeah. Justin, thank you so much for that question. If you've got a question like Justin has, head to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail, and then you can also ask OG your question. Man, we've got a fun Friday coming up. We've got Alyssa Mazes joining our roundtable on Friday. It's always fun chatting with Alyssa. Hope you can join us for our Friday show. Also, next week, we have an exciting week of shows we begin on Wednesday our What Should We Have Learned from This Year shows. Katie Gaddy's going to join us from Morning Brew on Wednesday. And on Friday, our roundtable team is going to tackle what uh, they learned from the events of 2022. Those are always great shows. Hope you can join us. We're going to kick it off, though, with Mama Chef blogger Karen Nakamowski, who not only has some phenomenal easy recipes to make your holiday season much, much simpler and still keeping it somewhat healthy and at the same time uh, saving you money. But also, and this is cool, OG, she also has uh, opened a soup kitchen and she talks about giving this time of year as well. Nice. So we're going to help you simplify it, spend more time with your community. Good stuff. Great week next week to round out our year. And then of course the last week of the year, we're going to have our most inspiring interviews of 2022. And man, there were a ton to choose from. It was a great year here hanging out with you stackers. But if you're not here for recipes or for inspiring interviews, you're concerned about the market and the chat around a recession, OG and his team put together a free guide that shares eight moves to make in a down market. This will help you plan more and panic less no matter what the market does. So head over to stackybenjamins.com slash guide. That's stackybenjamins.com slash guide and get this helpful free guide from OG. That wraps up our Wednesday. Doug, a lot of stuff here, I'm sure. What should we have learned today? I'm going to boil it down to three things, Joe. First, take some advice from Eric Wood. Finding yourself in a pivot spot? Think bigger about your overall situation. Second, Thinking about retirement? Consider your drawdown strategy. Where will the money come from and how can you protect it? It's better to make evaluating your drawdown an ongoing process than a one-time event. But the big lesson? Always store your money in an insured account and never by trying to stack it toward the moon. That would have been good to know before today. Thanks to Eric Wood for joining us today. You can find his book, Tackle What's Next, anywhere you buy your business books based on football metaphors. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. 
I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at The Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Guys, I thought something we'd do. We've t- we of course uh, talk a lot in the after show here about movies, about TV shows, but I thought it'd be good with people with a lot of streaming time coming up to maybe give like your top. What's the top streaming thing you saw this year? So stackers can have some quality time and not waste time. Little heads up on this, Joe would have been nice. Oh, oh, so you have no idea what yours will be? I, I have a few that I love. I can't say that I watched them this year. So that part might be time just flies way too fast for you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? You know what I wish they did that was easier is you can get to it. I know in prime and in Netflix is, but an easy way to see what you've watched in over the course of the year. Fun if they did the thing that Spotify does, you know, and I, I think Apple does it too, where it's like they unwrap your year and say, you wasted X amount of hours streaming stuff this you year. You had 17,000 hours of television this year. Your most watched thing is this Burger King commercial. <laughs> but uh, no, it's there. You can dig for it. And I often have thought to do it when I'm trying to recommend to people like some of my favorite stuff. But it's just a hassle. You, you know, it's buried it should be an easy link, but I like your idea about the Spotify. I think thing. we'd probably both agree on Jack Reacher. We'd both yeah. agree on, to some degree, Terminal List. I think for an action kind of popcorn. I still thing. haven't seen Terminal List. Wait a minute. Okay, so hold on. Should I watch Terminal List first, or Doug? Should I watch the one that you're watching right now first? Echo, uh, whatever. Oh, like between those two, geez. probably mm. Terminal List. <sighs> um, I mean, I didn't. I know you didn't love it. Yeah. I lost the thread on Echo 3, but I I didn't love Terminal List less than I didn't love Echo 3. Yeah. Uh, I if uh, Between those two, Joe, I'd go Terminal List, but neither of them are spectacular. I want to go look and see what I've watched. because we're, we're still elbow deep in Yellowstone, which I think is probably my favorite thing right now. Doug, you said that this latest uh, season you did not love. Yeah, I don't know. I actually, even last season, I didn't love. I keep watching it because, as you accused me for the last twenty years, Joe, I'm an I'm a I'm completionist. A completionist. Yeah, yeah, and so I keep watching it because, like, I know the characters and I kind of like the vibe. But from a storyline perspective, it's it's not pulling me in like it did it's for kinda, the first two. It's or the three same seasons. thing over and over again. Yeah. It's like whatever. What you know? What's the apocalypse du jour? Who's trying to take the ranch? How are we going to kill them all? Oh, okay, they're right. all dead. And then I just don't, I don't need the the music video moments they have of, you know, they just find a way to get some, you know, singing performance that I think recently they were at a bar where Beth starts a fight. And then before that, I think during their John Dutton's inaugural ball thing at the ranch, they had... Spoiler alert. Well, by now... Yeah, I'm on like season si- four, bro, so settle down. Well, but all of those same examples work you know there's just too many times where it feels like a western music video to me and i like the music i love the music that they choose in that show but it just feels yeah. like oh let's pause here for a cool western i read scene an article cool that said that taylor sheridan requires either a sunrise or a sunset scene in every show <laughs> no, really. it's she's contractually Which, obligated yeah yeah i think it's a he though right isn't taylor sheridan it's a, yeah taylor oh a sorry okay 
You could tell I don't watch it. Oh, you probably haven't gotten here watch yet. It. Yeah, you probably haven't gotten here yet, OG. But uh, Taylor Sheridan shows up in Latin season four as an actor. And I'm, I mean, I don't think you've, it's towards the end of the season, so I don't think you've uh, gotten there yet. But yeah, no, season four started with the gunfight in the street, which was pretty epic. Oh, yeah. A pretty epic kind of intro to the season. But um, yeah, uh, finish the crown. Got through all that. Oh, love the crown. That's pretty decent. It's so much better than anything else we've talked about. Contextual storytelling around historical events. And it's obviously all make-believe. There's probably some some thread of truth in some of the stuff. But they take a history item and then spin a story around it, which I think is kind of cool. Just a compelling story. Yeah. But I'm not watching any of that crap right now. It's like bowl season, man. Like bowl yeah. season starts Army Navy game last week. And then it's like literally bowls every day until the middle of January. And then, and then we all cry. We know what OG's, OG's feeding on. I like this year. I like the bear. I know Doug, we agreed on that one. Oh, that was this year. Absolutely. Huge fan of that. Huge fan of that. Came out of nowhere. Uh, great show. I also watch a lot of business documentaries, but I have to say still, even if you're not a fan of racing, the new season of drive to survive is just a great look into the business of formula one. Uh, first, this was season three, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, first two seasons were great. I didn't love season three as much. And then I found out that in season three, a lot of the drivers refused to go on camera because they felt like the producers and director were just creating drama that wasn't really there. And that maybe that's why I didn't like it. Maybe I like the drama. Did you see, though, what some of the top, uh, some of the heads of the team said? Somebody asked, you know, Max Verstappen, the top driver in Formula One for the second year running now this year. He was one of the guys that refused to participate. And they yeah. asked his boss, Christian Horner. And Christian Horner said, really? It's not real? It's it's reality TV where they're creating <laughs> drama? Really? <laughs> it was, when it was that so ever good. Happened before? Look, looking at the difference between the way he looks at it. Of course, he's married to one of the Spice Girls, so I think he probably, yeah, right. he probably gets it. <laughs> but I really like that. And you know what? Uh, uh, I know a lot of people loved the last season of Ted Lasso. I thought it was good. It didn't didn't make my didn't make my year end list. Instead, on that same network, I really this year liked uh, the latest season of of Trying. I thought Trying just got better Ooh. every season this year. It was super good. You reminded me of all kinds of things, Joe. Yeah, I I mostly agree with that. Though I did like the Ted Lasso season almost as much as the first one, so I'm good with that. But I like Trying. Um, I have to admit this. I I thought about this last night. I know earlier in the episode, you said you were thinking of me. I was thinking of you last night, Joe. Oh, boy. Of course. Duh. Uh, and I don't feel comfortable saying this, but you might have been right about Tehran. Oh. Because I'm, we're starting to rewatch. Like, I'm rewatching it. Mrs. Neighbor Doug hasn't seen it yet. So she's, we just finished three episodes, and it is better than I thought the first time I watched it. The stakes are so high. Somebody's going to die any moment. I love steaks. It's a little, I don't, mm, meat, but it's a little slow, but it's still very good. It will speed up as it goes. It will, it will just continue to speed up to the point that there were times I was uncomfortable. I wanted to pause the episode just because it was so uncomfortable, which Whoa. to me is great TV. And I'm like, oh my, I don't know if I can watch this next scene because they're taking you exactly where they need to go. And you're like, I don't want to watch that, but I totally want to watch that. So let's play it, but let's not play it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which to me is, is I'm so great. confused right now. The thing that came out of left field for me last year was an older show called Kim's Convenience, which I've talked about here before, but that was 2022. Kim's Convenience was just, was the show that I'm like, where the hell was I? You know what else I did this with a long time ago? Everybody, loved, everybody loves Raymond. I discovered after it was off the air. And uh, Cheryl and I like binge watch the show afterwards, but everybody loves Raymond. Yeah, it's really good. Still great TV. I mean, and I didn't watch this last year, but one that I continue to recommend to people that I don't think got enough viewership when it was on. It got a lot of critical acclaim, but not nearly enough people watched it. But it was on for like seven seasons is The Americans. I still absolutely love that show. Somebody, espionage yeah somebody on a um oh on a, i've got a good one on one of those creator shows doug was talking about the americans and just how great tv it was so, and how largely people missed it i mean the numbers were good but not phenomenal and somebody was talking about just last week about on, what, on, phenomenal it was. on the same network the old man 
Yeah. That's probably the best show I watched this year. That one I Man. missed too, and I got to go see it. Way, way Not better go see it, than... turn on my TV. Yeah. yeah, no, OG's right. Way better than Terminal List or Echo 3. A hundred times. Hundred yeah. times better than that. Yeah, old yeah, man, sure. really good. We need to keep man. a list of this stuff. If only there were a way. If only. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's extra good. 